Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another New Jersey Constitutional Republican virtual conversation. It's our great uh, honor again to have our good friend, Professor John Schaff from Northern University in beautiful South Dakota. Professor, great to have you again. It's been great, great to be back with you, JR. It's been too long, so I'm looking forward to our conversation, getting back in some good old Lincoln. That's right. And of course, uh, the highlight of our conversations are your great book, Abraham Lincoln's Statesmanship and the Limits of Liberal Democracy, which we're taking a great analytical view of, because we believe that uh, your book is uh, important to reforming the Republican Party into getting the Republican Party back to uh, thinking and acting more like Abraham Lincoln. And uh, of course, um, the eternal and universal principles that he has founded and that he turned to in, uh, in essentially being one of the party's greatest creators, of course, his first president. Yep. Yep. So, so uh, today we're gonna talk about um, the chapter uh, that you wrote. And just let me uh, bring up for the audience um, professor, the book there, there is the book, Abraham Lincoln's yep. statesmanship and the limits of liberal democracy. And as we've been saying with all of our, um, previous, uh, telecasts that, uh, every constitutional Republican, not only in New Jersey, but throughout the country and every citizen of the United States should buy this book. Um, it's a great, uh, work done by professor Schaff and we were really honored um, to have him discuss this book in the episodes that we've well, already Well, if every done. citizen in the United States buys one, I will buy you a steak dinner jar. <laughs> so, <laughs> my well, royalties sure will be, uh, will be uh, uh, over the moon. Well, first of all, I truly mean that, that everyone should, especially constitutional Republicans, all Republicans and all citizens should be buying this book. I mean, this should be being taught in history classes and, uh, and in civics classes. And of course, um, if that's true, make sure that that steak dinner occurs in New Jersey soil, because I think you're going to be getting here before I'm out there to uh, South Dakota. Yeah. <laughs> but I do, I do want to come visit you someday. We can't wait. We got a lot of, we got a lot of <laughs> wide open space we can show you. So. No, that's good. I'm, uh, um, yep. uh, I would love to be out there and we'll do that sometime. But let's talk yep. about Lincoln and the defense of natural rights. And uh, of course, we finished up the last, the first chapter, which was uh, Lincoln's prudence and moder mo moderation and statesmanship. And you said that Lincoln understood that a democratic statesman cannot safely ignore public opinion, but rather it was the leader's task to shape that op opinion towards justice. And that's what we yes. need from our Republican leader today. And of course, the central point of the Peoria speech, the famous Peoria speech in 1854, argues against the notion that there is mm -hmm. no right principle of action um, of self-interest or no right principle of action than uh, like self-interest. So talk about that self-interest principle um, and, and what he was trying to say there in the Peoria speech regarding self-interest. Might have some technical difficulties um, with the reception maybe on the coming from uh, South Dakota. Just give the yeah, professor- I've, I've, I've got you back. Are. Great. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it's a, a little bit slow connection. Um, it's okay. Uh, it, it just to give yeah to, to give a little bit of the context. Um, remember that what Lincoln's talking about in the Peoria speech is it's a criticism of Stephen Douglas and uh, the mm -hmm. idea of popular sovereignty that the way right. that the Western territories should solve the the slavery problem is instead of Congress banning slavery, is Douglas said that the people of, of the slave state or of those territories, I should say, should decide themselves whether they should have slavery or not. And right. his argument was essentially that it should be up to the self-interest of the people who live there. 
And I think there, there, there is a presumption on the part of, of Douglas that, it, that for all sorts of reasons that we aren't worth going into that, the Western territories near, again, we're specifically talking about Kansas and Nebraska, um, weren't really amenable to slave labor. And so slave labor wouldn't go out there because it wasn't in the self-interest of the people who would settle that land. And what right. Lincoln didn't like about that is precisely mm -hmm. that line you just quoted is that something uh, that is a question of natural right, namely, mm -hmm. is it just to have property mm -hmm. in another human being should not be left up to self-interest. Um, and that, that mm -hmm. Douglas was giving up a, a big principle uh, there. Instead of saying we will not extend slavery to the West because it's a violation of natural justice, it's a violation of natural right. The argument mm -hmm. of Douglas is simply, well, it's it, we sh you know, it won't spread because you know it just won't work out, which um, which gives up the moral high ground and it, and it refuses mm -hmm. to say that slavery is actually wrong, and mm -hmm. and that's really what what Lincoln means by in, in this critique of self-interest is that that we don't make our decisions purely on self-interest. Uh, even there, you know, just majority rule is the kind of self-interest and you know, we're all for majority rule and consent to the governed, but that consent has to be uh, consistent with, mm -hmm. with natural right. There are certain right. things that we as individuals, then we as a body politic cannot justly consent to. And slavery is one of those. And so Lincoln's position was that, well, it was there at the founding and they made some concessions of it in the constitution, but here we've got virgin territory, if you will. Na natural right says we shouldn't extend this to a place where it hasn't been before. Uh, and, and on that ground, that ground of natural right. Right. And then of course, Lincoln um, goes back, he really revitalizes um, the Declaration of Independence in this argument. And uh, he said in the same speech, he said, let us readopt the Declaration of Independence and with it, the practices and the policies which harmonize with it, which is precisely why we created this organization, Professor. Mm -hmm. The Constitutional Republican mm -hmm. is looking back to Lincoln and we say we must readopt the Declaration of Independence and with it, the practices and policies which harmonize with it. And that gets back to the, uh, rec to the authority that the founders looked to in requesting the separation from the King of England, which was the laws of nature and nature's God. And then the self-evident truth that we're all created equal, uh, unalienable rights of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, and then the consent of the governed. And then of course the right mm -hmm. to abolish. So Lincoln goes yep. back to the declaration and he says, all honor to Jefferson, to the man who in the concrete pressure of a struggle for national independence by single people had the coolness forecasting capacity to introduce into a merely revolutionary document an abstract truth applicable to all men at all time. So to embalm it there that today and in all coming days, it shall be a rebuke and a stumbling block to the very harbingers of reappearing tyranny and oppression. So Lincoln goes back to the declaration, professor. Yeah, so what he wants to do is obviously, you know, Lincoln calls the principles of the, the declaration, you know, the axioms of free government. And so right. these are the things, if you know, think back to your geometry, you know, Lincoln was a big fan of geometry. He liked his Euclid. Um, yeah. and, and axiom is this thing that you take for granted. It, it's not a thing to be proven, but it's a thing that you take as the starting point and then your proofs in geometry go, go from there. And so right. the axioms of free government are the principles of the Declaration, which you just articulated, namely natural equality, natural right, consent to the governed, and then and, uh, the right to revolution. Um, and again, the, the, the problem with, and you can sort of, I, I, I think everybody, it, it doesn't take a lot of effort for me to show why, why slavery and why uh, uh, the, the defenders, the, the positive good side of slavery was is a violation of the Declaration of Independence, in fact, by the mid 1850s, many defenders of slavery were admitting this. Uh, mm -hmm. Whether it's you know John Calhoun or George Fitzhugh or eventually you know Alexander Stevens, they admitted uh, mm -hmm. that they, they called the, the Declaration of Independence self-evident truths were self-evident falsehoods. Uh, they said so. Yeah. They're not even pretending. Um, but what uh, 
is, is uh, Lincoln's argument against people like Stephen Douglas is precisely that that you 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 takes now there there's one good we mentioned there consent to the governed right because the constitution the constitution the declaration says that to secure these rights governments are instituted among men deriving their uh, con uh, their consent from the government just power just right? power. yeah there yeah and so consent is a good thing but that consent has to be consistent with what precedes that and that's the natural equality and the natural rights and so that's why he yes. said that he he feared that what Douglas was doing is forcing people to make war against the Constitution. Or I, I keep saying Constitution, Declaration, and I mean, teach a lot of Constitution Day, so it's on my mind. Um, and <laughs> but also the idea of who's included among all men are created equal, right? right. And, and Douglas needed to say, well, they didn't really mean all men. Um, and you know, he's there's one of the uh, uh, one of the lines in one of the the Lincoln Douglas debates is you no, know, they didn't they didn't mean Negroes or he's yeah, one place says Fiji Islanders. You know, uh, I've right. seen any races that uh, uh, that maybe not from European stock. And Lincoln just says that no, that's not true. And they said all they meant all. And one of the things that's on Lincoln's mind is that that in a way, what 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 Douglas has to argue is that all the Declaration did was announced that the people who are in America in 77, 1776 were equal to those in Great Britain. And that's it. But one of the things that Lincoln assumes, well, we've had all sorts of people who have no connection to Great Britain in 1776. He's thinking of, of Irish immigrants, of German immigrants. And this idea of once you get rid of this idea of natural equality, and we say, let's set that aside because there are there are these things we really want, and this idea of natural rights sort of gets in the way. It's sort of a buzzkill. Uh, let's lay mm -hmm. that aside so we can get what we want. It's it's not that big of a leap to say, once you say these people aren't included, it gets real easy to start putting other people into that not included category. Because the, 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 the groups of people who are not included in residents of America 1776 and their descendants are legion. Uh, there, 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 are any, there are a whole lot of those people, and it makes it really easy to start justifying the tyranny of this people over these people once you give up the principle of natural equality and to go back to our opening discussion to say we should settle these things not on the grounds of natural justice, but just what's in our self-interest. Right. And you know what's amazing too, Professor, is that the same people Stephen Douglas, uh, all of those of the positive good school, uh, Calhoun, Alexander Stevens, they were so, all saying and arguing that uh, the Declaration of Independence didn't mean all men, it only meant white Englishmen. And that's precisely the same argument that the progressive left Democrats say today. They say the same thing about the Declaration. Well, it didn't mean black, black people, it didn't mean this group of people, it didn't mean people of color. And they have the same exact argument with the people who they yeah. uh, detest so much. And yet they're right there with them. And, and they're both uh, in symmetry with one another in their idea that the Declaration was not for all. We clearly know that the Declaration of Independence meant with by all men meant every single human being ever created. But isn't that a strange uh, relationship well, between sure, today and that, yesterday? That, that's, yesterday. A, that's a really good Points. So let's let's think about that for a second. So, for example, mm -hmm. if you look at the lead essay of the sixteen nineteen project uh, right. by Nicole Hannah Jones, and th there's a lot going on in that essay. But one of the things is is that she wants to cast doubt. Obviously, the the, the very basis of the thing is to cast doubt on the notion of seventeen seventy six as our founding, and she wants to say right. that the real story, the central story of America, is not the principles of the Declaration of Independence but is slavery. And in the course of doing that, when she gets to 1775, 1776, is she has to undermine the authority of the founders by claiming they yes. didn't really mean what they said they meant. And, and she makes yeah. some historical errors. I think we all know that some of these people, including Thomas Jefferson, were slaveholders. But it's also true that Thomas Jefferson had a bill for emancipation of slavery, for, of slaves in Virginia in 1784. Uh, and I think the, the record is pretty clear. When he said all men, he meant everybody. 
uh, and yeah. that it, he recognized that these principles are antagonistic to slavery. And his own inability to translate that to his private life is yet more ev evidence that human beings are sinful, as if we needed any more. Um, right. uh, if, if the charge against Jefferson is that he's a hypocrite, fair enough, uh, conceded. Uh, but the fact of the hypocrisy of some of our founders has not undermined the, the centrality of those principles to the American regime. And this is why if you look at Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, right? And he starts out by echoing the, the, the Gettysburg Address. When he starts talking yes. about, I don't remember my numbers, I, he says, I think like five score and something years ago. He's, he's dating back yes. to 1863. Of course, how does Lincoln start Gettysburg Address? Four score and seven years ago. What's he dating back to? He's doing a call back to 1776. Uh, you yes. see this in Frederick Douglass, where he uses the analogy. I think this is in his oration on Lincoln in, 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 in 1876, that there is this chain of justice, and it needs an anchor. You need to, if for, in order for a chain to, to work, it's got to be anchored to something, and that anchor is the Declaration of Independence. And so Douglass yes. and Martin Luther King mm -hmm. are calling us back to 1776, and their complaint, of course, is precisely that we have these principles and we have not lived up to them, as opposed yeah. to what, we, what you see, what, you, what you're referring to in, 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 on, on the left at times in our day, which is we reject these principles or no one really ever believed these principles and, and maybe we should refound on, on different principles. And, and so you're right that, yes. that they're, they're these, the, 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 the positive good school of the, of the 1850s and at least parts of, um, of the progressive left today have this in common, is that they are at war with the American founding and they're interested in rejecting the American founding, which we can talk about a lot next time when we talk about progressives and I can, uh, uh, my, my, my ability to critique them uh, knows no bounds. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, you're, you're right to say that there, there is something going on, that there is this, uh, this symmetry between the two. Yeah, and we're going to look forward to when we get into the. We first we're going to do political economy, then we're going to get into. Okay, the all right. So two but, times from now, we'll, uh, we'll we'll pick on the progressives. Right. So we're gonna we're we're gonna look forward to that, Professor. Yeah. Yeah. But I just want to say that it was also written into the Constitution that twenty years after the um, the the resolution to uh, to accept the Constitution uh, amended or brought in by the states. Uh, clarified that the slave trade would end 20 years after, which occurred under under Thomas Jefferson's uh, administration. Okay. And also it was under Thomas Jefferson's administration that the Northwest Ordinance was signed, which would territory, bringing in that territory, which would uh, note slavery would be allowed on those territories. So the founders, of course, were, all, were from the very beginning hoping for its extinction. And what's amazing as we finish this part of it up is, is that Hannah Nicole Smith and Roger Tatey uh, the Chief Justice and Dred Scott are perfectly aligned in their thinking uh, on what the what the meaning of the Declaration of Independence is, and that to me truly is amazing. But it's it's reality. It's, well, it's a fact. I, I think we can see uh, what, what, maybe what if what your uh, viewers and listeners should do is you know go back to you know you mentioned the Northwest Ordinance. You know, go back to Lincoln's Cooper Institute address of 1860, where he does an extensive uh kind of his historical exegesis on the northwest ordinance uh and yep. in, in, in what he wants to show and, and he does show is that of of all the people who are at the constitutional convention who also were in congress and had the opportunity to vote on the northwest ordinance uh i forget that it, it, it was like it's like 30 out of 35 or something like that uh voted for the northwest ordinance which banned slavery in what was then the Northwest Territories, which would be like Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, uh, today in Wisconsin. Uh, yeah. that's, that's what it was. That's what it was organized. And so it, it banned slavery. And what, what Lincoln, what Lincoln can sit, the point he consistently makes, and I think with this, he's, he's right, is that whatever, you know, the American founding on slavery is complicated. And that's mm -hmm. that's one of the critiques you can you can make out of, uh, of the 1619 project is it, it is it makes something that's really complicated seem like it's simple, uh, and mm -hmm. you can make it simple on the other side too, 
but but the, the tendency of our days is to make it simple like like they were they were pro-slavery or they they were uh, uh, indifferent to slavery and I don't think that's true. I think Lincoln is right is that the ethos of the American founding is is strongly anti-slavery. There is an assumption yes. it's in the writings of of Madison, of Jefferson, yes. uh, the people who are Southern slaveholders. Their assumption is that slavery is on its way out. That's a good thing. Uh, no, that's why you know it's not mentioned. In, the word slavery is not in the U.S. Constitution because. As Frederick Douglass said, you didn't actually have to change a word of the U.S. Constitution in order to get rid of slavery. Now, in the end, we we did, but his point was that you didn't need to, because the 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 document doesn't get doesn't give um, uh, specific defense of it. Is that you've got an ethos of here's this thing we're going to deal with now. We think it's on its way out. We think this next generation is going to get rid of it. And the great failure there is that once you move from the founding generation to that second generation, of course, many people would point to the origin of the cotton gin and the, the yeah. massive <laughs> profitability of cotton is that all sorts of economic interests get tied up in slavery. And, and the South's attitude, while the North is becoming more anti-slavery, the South becomes more pro-slavery. To the point, as we're saying, by the time you get to the 1840s and certainly the 1850s, you, you've got you've gone from a sort of toleration of a bad thing that would even be the in, in many cases, not all cases, but many cases. In fact, I would say the prevailing attitude even of the South in the founding generation was here: we have to tolerate this bad thing. By the time you get to the 1840s, 1850s, you get the positive, good, good school, uh, and, and an actual attack on natural rights and and this is the the, the realm in which which lincoln is operating right and, uh, i don't know if you're able to see it yet but uh, cnn has done a series uh, on lincoln i watched the first episode and, and a lot of the uh, a lot of the scholars and authors professors that they had on there some of them um, think Lincoln should be like John should have been like John Brown that he should have been an avid abolitionist and he should have been very extreme but of course Lincoln wasn't going to receive the vote of one black slave he had to convince uh, white people of uh, the natural rights that uh, also were applicable to the black slaves and he had to do it in such a way he did it through the prudence and moderation that you talked about and he had to do it by convincing and, and, and influencing the public sentiment to realize that yes, the, equal, uh, the equality of all men also includes the black man. And he was up against a tremendous um, task in doing that. And he was successful in doing it so much to the point where he became president of the United States because he articulated this argument. But it's amazing how learned people still are, are disappointed that Lincoln didn't do enough quickly enough, uh, but he yeah. did what he could. Yeah, let, let me speak to that. Oh, I, I just got oh, uh, last week. I was engaged in a conference, uh, a, a virtual conference done, done via Zoom, but uh, on anti-slavery writings, uh, mostly of the 19th century, 1830s to 1850s. And you know, in the discussion I had with my fellow conference members, uh, a point someone made, and it's really been playing on my mind, is that what you have to realize is different people play different roles. And, you know, and there are, you know, Lincoln, of course, was not an abolitionist. Uh, no. He wasn't an abolitionist like William Lloyd Garrison or Joshua Giddings uh, or even like, like Frederick Douglass. Um, right. What Lincoln was, was a statesman. So yes. when, when you're uh, kind of you know, an activist, you know, we need people to play, to be those gadflies, to sting hard. Right. Yes. And to prick people's consciousness, but but Lincoln's role was not that role. So as you point out, like for example, one of the one of the readings that that I looked at for part of this conference was a speech, exact same time that that Lincoln is giving the Peoria speech in 1854 is Joshua Giddings, an abolitionist who was in Congress, giving his speech in Congress about the uh, Kansas Nebraska Act, right. and he's talking about. Uh, Northerners who were going to vote for the Kansas-Nebraska Act, so his opponents, um, you know, calling them Tories and traitors, and in various parts of the country they're being burned in effigy. And he said, "Well, you know, maybe they deserve to be burned in effigy." 
and um, you know, you guys are on the side of the devil. And you know, if you were going to give a speech guaranteed to lose you a national election in 1854 or the ensuing years, that would be the speech you would give. Um, yeah. And uh, now it might be helpful in some ways for for you know, the advantage of some of these radical abolitionists, even of John Brown, is that it makes Lincoln look real moderate uh, in contrast. If you remember in the Cooper Institute address that I referenced of 1860, February 1860, he brings up John Brown, specifically yep. to distance himself from it. He says, John Brown, yep. we're not John Brown. John Brown was no Republican. Um, right. Uh, and, uh, and, and so his role, and as you mentioned, you know, you, you've got to appeal to a lot of people who don't agree with you on everything. And you think about, you know, in, in the mid 1850s in, in Illinois, you know, in Illinois, it was illegal for, for blacks to uh, migrate to Illinois. That's how racist it was. It was uh, yeah. uh, uh, a strongly racist place. Um, and to say that I'm going to go out there, I'm going to talk about total equality. And I'm going to talk mm -hmm. about you know, immediate abolition just like this. Whatever yep. justice is behind that, as he says in the Peoria speech, this is not where public opinion is. And so right. this is you know, you know, our, our subject of natural rights. He wants to maintain in the people's minds, natural right, natural right. And anything mm -hmm. else, he's willing to make concessions on that without giving up the principle, right? Yeah. Knowing that as a matter of law and as a matter of practicality, we can't get, because obviously, you know, as he says in his letter to uh, 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 Horace Greeley in 1862, he says, my personal feelings are that all men everywhere should be free, but as president of the United States, I'm constrained by the law. So we know his personal feelings were kind of small a abolitionist, right? Um, yeah. But as a matter of policy, uh, the advocation of immediate abolition um, was a non-starter if you want to win, as say, a national election. There are obviously there are parts of the country where you could win on a strict abolitionist ground, but if you want to win the presidency in 1856 or say 1860 when Lincoln actually runs, you can't run on a strict abolitionist uh, platform, or you're 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 not going anywhere. Right, and of course, it also gets overlooked, uh, Professor, that in 1837, when he stayed, uh, when he served in the State House in Illinois, he did was he and one other individual signed a petition uh, to uh, abolish slavery in Illinois. Yeah, um, and so right from the very beginning, he he made known his uh, how he detested slavery and how he thought it was unjust. Well, and, Lincoln, uh, when, again, just, when he was a member of the legislature, he was one of only six members of the Illinois legislature who voted no on right. a resolution to denounce abolitionism. So he was not an abolitionist, right. but he didn't feel like he needed to denounce it. When he was in right. his one term in Congress, he was a supporter of the Wilmot Proviso to ban mm -hmm. slavery and the territories gained in the Mexican War. Um, right. I think it, uh, it's not like we have to work really hard to establish Abraham Lincoln's anti-slavery uh, uh, anti-slavery credentials. Um, uh, and it's just, you know, for Lincoln, you know, the, 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 there's, there is this balance. This was a, his role is the statesman role. And so he's got to, we've talked about this at length in, in previous discussions, but the role is to balance various competing goods. And also, as, as I've said, uh, a statesman needs to be two steps ahead of public opinion, but he can't be 10 steps. Uh, and so right. he's got to be mm -hmm. careful. Um, uh, about being too far ahead of public opinion, or obviously you you lose, uh, and and that's that's difficult. That's that's difficult for for statesmen to do to figure out exactly where are the people and, and how far can I lead before I'm I'm too far out ahead and I've and I've lost the people. Which, as you say, doesn't doesn't do any good to be pure in your principles and not free any slaves whatsoever. That's right. Now. Professor, talk to us a little bit about the subtitle in the chapter, Discoveries and Inventions, Technology oh, geez, yeah. and Natural Rights. Yeah. Talk to us about that. One of my favorite that. subjects. Uh, you know, this is a great lecture that, that Lincoln gave. And I don't know if you've read it, JR. It's, it's kind of goofy, I, I, I will admit. So in, in, in 1858, well, I guess 59, 
uh, right after the the the, the Lincoln Douglas thing, he he comes up with this lecture, which comes to us in two parts, but it's probably one thing which in history has been separated. We don't have the full document, but it's just, so I'm going to call it one lecture, even though if you look at Lincoln's collected works, which are you know, sitting behind me here, it's actually separated to two, a first and a second, but I'm going to talk about them like there, there's, there's only one because there, there probably was. But so it seems odd, he's, but you know, since, since 1854, so for the previous say five years, all Lincoln has talked about is slavery. And then he gives this goofy sort of lecture about discoveries and inventions where he talks about, oh, uh, uh, how did we learn to read? How did we develop the alphabet? How did people learn to write? What in, and he goes through this history of invention. He goes in the Bible and goes, when Abraham invented this and this guy invented that, mm-hmm. does it a power of steam. Uh, he's got this kind of, it's, you can't go, well, why is this guy doing this when all he's been talking about is slavery? And it's, 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 it's kind of strange. But then he says, what he does at one point is he, 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 what he wants to do, one thing what he wants to do is, is, he, is he wants to show the ability of human beings to, to progress and to make their lives better, right? And it goes back to the, the old Whig notion that we may have talked about the right to rise. Right, the right, right of an individual to improve his condition. And one of the right. ways to do that is through discoveries, through inventions, we can kind of, we can lighten our load. He actually used, you know, one man can carry so much, one man and a donkey can carry that more, one man and a donkey and a wagon can carry even more than that, right? So you improve mm-hmm. yourself, you know, one man with a plow, a donkey with a plow, so on and so forth, right? right. So we become more efficient in our labor and we can improve our, our, our condition. And at one point, he says, there's these various inventions, he says, that were real, real breakthroughs uh, uh, and really liberated humanity in, in a weird way. It was a big push forward in discovering invention. And some of them are weird because they're not really inventions. Now, one of them is, he mentions the printing press as this great invention. He also mentions the Reformation, which is not really an invention, but it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a way to get new ideas. He mentions yep. the discovery of America as an invention, right? That, okay, we're in this new land and it opens up new possibilities. Then he also mentions, he sort of throws in there, he says, the invention of the Negro, or at least the present use of him. Mm. Um, and so he mentions the, uh, the presence of slavery. And I think, and for anybody, when you read that in context of everything else Lincoln is talking about from you know, 1854 to 1860, it makes you think, well, why does he bring that in there? I think what, he, what he's doing is he's saying, you know, we believe in progress. We believe in, 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 in uh, we'll talk about this next time, of, of economic progress, of the ability to rise. And one of the things he's talking about, one of the, I think one of the, one of the passages in, in the piece is he criticizes a movement called the Young American Movement, of which mm-hmm. uh, Stephen Douglas was a big part of. And this, the Young American Movement was this idea that we're, it, it was, it's really kind of an outgrowth of Manifest Destiny, that we're going to take over all this geographic territory. And as America extends the territory, it will bring freedom with it. But part of the idea of that is, is that wealth comes from land, not from productivity. Right? And Lincoln mm-hmm. wants to defend that it's productivity, right? It's being productive with what you have that makes you wealthy. We don't need land because yes. one of the reasons people want to extend land is they want to extend slavery, right? That's one of the reasons yeah. why they want to do that. And then when he brings up that invention of the Negro thing, it's a way of saying we're, we're all for invention, we're all for discovery, we're all for progress, but there's a limit to it. And mm-hmm. anyone who had read enough Lincoln knows that the idea of the Negro as an invention, as if he's a tool, is mm-hmm. wrong. And so as we try to progress as a people, even though whether in this case he's talking mostly about scientific and economic progress, there's a natural limit to that. And that limit is the, the natural rights of the human person. So the mm-hmm. idea that we would use a human person as a tool to try to to try to help us be more economically successful is offensive to him. He, he, is, right. he doesn't really say it in, in discoveries and invention, but I think if you read it in the context of every everything he says, 
I think it's obvious what he's what he's trying to do by this sort of casual kind of uh, uh, oh by the way reference to to slavery is here's a limit to uh, our desire to progress. Right. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting that you put that in there. Yeah. And then finally, uh, the last subtitle of the ch yeah. chapter, Professor, is Natural Rights and Democratic Poetry. Yeah. So please uh, give us a little bit of insight into that. Sure. So um, here's what I think. You know, I, in, in that section of the book, I, I look at a handful of critics of natural right theory. And I, I think there's a, a credible kind of counter argument uh, to natural rights theory. And, and it usually comes in some form of, well, really one of two forms. There, there's one form kind of comes from a more traditionalist medieval natural law uh, background. Mm -hmm. You see this, one of the people I cite in the book is a contemporary political philosopher, Robert Cranach, uh, mm -hmm. who says that, that the problem with natural rights is that it starts with a critique of authority. Uh, and mm -hmm. this is dangerous for all sorts of reasons, which I won't go into here. You've got other, uh, another strain that is kind of a, a Burkean strain, an Edmund Burkean strain. Right. That, you know, yeah. Burke I believed in natural rights, but wasn't. But his his view was 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 more that we should our our rights should develop through custom and tradition because he was worried mm -hmm. about appeals to abstract principles and the notion that we should. It's it really you know, his, his concern is about ideological politics that will come up with these uh -huh. abstract ideas and we're gonna to try to cram reality into our abstract ideas. So he said, maybe we should just be, look more to what are the customs of our people, the traditions of our people, and, and that's where we should derive our rights from. Like I, said, mm -hmm. I, I, I actually think that there's some justice to, to, to both of those critiques. But what right. Lincoln does, and this is sort of my take on it, is I, I think Brooke is onto something but yep. the habit, the, the narrative of our people is the narrative of natural rights. And what, what, you need to, what we need is poets and statesmen who can turn this great concept and turn it into a poetry that is attractive to people. Mm, so yeah, yes. I, you know, I can't remember, I, I talk about this stuff all the time, so I can never remember what I've said, said in various things, but you know, I, it, it always is impressed <laughs> upon me. That, that Lincoln's education, which, which of course was very low on the formal side of things. Uh, he, he didn't right. really have much formal schooling, but right. here, a couple things Lincoln knew. He knew the King James Bible backward and forward. Uh, it's yes. not always clear how much he believed in the King James Bible, but he, he sure knew it backwards and forwards. Yes. He also knew his Shakespeare really well. Uh, there are a handful yes. of plays, there's about six or seven plays that Lincoln knew really well to the point of almost having them memorized, uh, yes. that he could recite entire scenes from memory. Um, yes. And what that did is, you know, that you know, the, the the English like to say that God spoke in King James uh, because it, yeah. it is it's a very poetic, uh, it's a very poetic translation of the Bible. So you know, when in our own heads, in our American heads, when we think of certain biblical verses, we're usually thinking the King James version. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, and, no and and Lincoln knew that, and so it, it gives him this facility with with language that is I think is really yeah. rare amongst a, you know, politicians. Um, and so what he was able to do is take these concepts and sort of wrap them in a narrative and wrap them in a language that is appealing to us and is compelling to us. And so, you know, you you when you read speeches today of presidents. Who you now they pay these speechwriters gobs of money, these professional yeah. speechwriters, yeah. to write these speeches. And I think you'd be hard pressed over the last 20 years, so pick presidents of either party, to think of a real memorable speech, one that, you know, yeah. they're not going to last 20 years, much less, you know, 150 or 160 years. Uh, we can't remember right. what they said, whereas Lincoln's right. words, we're still studying them. Uh, yeah. Because he's able to take these concepts, including the concept of natural right, and turn it into a poetry that yes. he takes this concept of natural rights and he makes it lovely. And, yes. and that's attractive to us, which is exactly what the statesman is supposed to do is that, you yeah. know, we want to appeal to reason. But if I can, you know, let me throw some C.S. Lewis at, at you. You know, well, Lewis yeah. drawing on, on Plato says, 
the head rules the stomach through the chest, right? You got to appeal yeah. to sediment to, to your heart. Uh, and so you need yeah. language that appeals to the heart. Now, hopefully the head and the heart are working together. We also think about right. these things. We're not merely sentimental. Uh, right. You can also defend these things rationally. But, but right. Lincoln's skill, I think, is really to do both, to give a rational argument and a poetic argument in favor of natural yep. right. Yeah. And that was probably formed uh, being that uh, prairie lawyer and yeah. uh, taking these cases before his uh, peers and the contemporaries in Illinois at that time. And he learned how to appeal, yep. uh, of course, of course, intellectually, but also a sentiment through sentiment as well. Yep. And that really honed his skill and his ability you to know, do that. People said that there, there are lots of lawyers in Illinois who knew the law better than Abraham Lincoln, but there weren't many who could argue in front of a jury better than Abraham Lincoln. Uh, he could wind a yeah. story that would convince people. That's right. And then, of course, he took that to a whole nother level with yep. these debates where thousands upon thousands of people would go and hear these well, debates, uh, which is truly remarkable and isn't something that we could even can really conceive of today. Yeah, it's almost unbelievable that Lincoln and, and Doug, give kudos to Douglas too, at least on this one, their ability to stand there for what, two and a half hours, I guess, per, per debate yeah, and just talk. Uh, yeah. And, and they, they weren't unlike today's debates where all they're doing is reciting uh, campaign slogans that someone else has written for them. And you try to package it in these little two minute segments. But these guys yeah. were talking for you know, one candidate, you know, one hour at a time. You had to give an hour long speech uh, and they're doing it all, you know, extemporaneously. They're not reading speeches. They just no. went out and they just talked. Uh, yeah. And to do that in a way that was consistently compelling and people paid attention to it. Uh, it yeah. was you know, better than TV. Uh, it was, it's, it's amazing. Yes, it was. Yep. Yeah, it truly is amazing that they could hold the, the, uh, the, uh, the people's interests that long. Yep. Uh, whereas yep. today, you know, if it's not done in 10 seconds, we're, yep. we're already tuned in to something else. Yep. Whereas, you know, they're there for an hour and they're listening to every word. And, and uh, that, you yeah. know, that's something that, uh, that needs to be thought about as we study today and we learn and we're learning about linking, we, re we read books. Uh, and why it's so important for young people. Of course, we talk about Lincoln's education. Well, he was self-educated. He read, he read every yep. possible thing he could read. Yep. Uh, he, when he was the postmaster, you know, he was reading all the newspapers that were coming yep. in. So he was very interested in political news. Yep. But uh, that's why it's so important for your students and students throughout the country uh, to really learn to read and to like to read and to read a lot. Couldn't have said it better myself. So amen. Well, <laughs> Well, listen, Professor, it's been another great talk. Uh, we really uh, had Agreed. a great uh, discussion on the on the chapter of Lincoln and uh, his mm -hmm. appeal to natural rights. And um, we're going to be back next uh, month and we're going to talk about uh, the political economy that Can't uh, wait. Lincoln was so, so very interested in. And that uh, you've Much really done a great subject, job. So I can't wait. Let me show again before we leave, uh, Professor, let me show again the book that people need to go out there and get. Um, so that uh, they're uh, well informed. Here's the book, Abraham Lincoln's State Statesmanship and the Limits of Liberal Democracy, which of course is going to be coming up in the later uh, couple of uh, shows from now as we get into yep. that, uh, the progressive mindset there, which yep. you really uh, touched on well with this book. Well, thank you so much for your time, Professor. Thanks, Again, it's always a great pleasure. And uh, we're learning and we want to continue to learn. And uh, we'll see you next month. And let's remember well, what Lincoln said. Liberty for all. Thank you very much, Professor, and we'll see you next time. We'll see you. Thank you.